Pass it on to Marjorie and Doug, I guess. I'm going to do the first scripture reading, which is John 19, 23 to 27. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among, among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son, and the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Allah, Allah, Lama, Sabakathini, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with, wa with wine, vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are still in the season of Lent, as, our, as has already been mentioned, and we're continuing our look at some of the very last things that Jesus said while he was on the cross. Uh, as he was suffering, after he was beaten, after he was wrongly judged. And these words or sayings of Jesus uh, were, were the last words before his death. And, and all of this that we are doing is in preparation uh, for Holy Week, which is just a few weeks away, where we actually next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and then we have Good Friday. It's our only Friday service, our only morning service of the year, actually, at 11 a.m. on Good Friday. Then we have Easter Sunday. And, uh, and today we're looking at two of those sayings of Jesus on the cross, the ones that were just read by Doug. And, and what we're doing during March is a pretty common uh, Christian practice during this season, the season of Lent, for those churches that acknowledge Lent. Uh, I really, for a very, very long time, for centuries upon centuries, Christians have carefully and thoughtfully considered the last words of the Messiah on the cross at this time of year, in particular before Easter. Uh, his words are rich with meaning. They are impactful, and they are literally the words of the Son of God, God in the flesh, as he hung on that cross. And we spend time reflecting on Jesus' last words on the cross to grow in our understanding and in our appreciation of the loss suffered on that day, of the love expressed that day, and the life given that day coming up that we call Good Friday. Good Friday, that day of loss and of sorrow and of disappointment and of emptiness, that day where for all appearances, hope had died. Keep in mind that for the disciples, it was a day where their worst imagination, the worst 
uh, thing that they could think of happened. It was a day where the bitterest, ugliest reality that they could have imagined came true. Their fears that they had about Jesus entering Jerusalem in what had become a toxic climate where the religious leaders were determined to no longer just challenge Jesus or try to trip him up in terms of the things he taught, but it was clear that their tolerance of Jesus had come to an end. And the disciples knew this, and they warned Jesus not to risk going into Jerusalem, which ironically means the city of peace. But he did go, and going into Jerusalem Events unfolded just like the prophets had predicted many, many years ago. And as Jesus hung on the cross, dying, he spoke. And elsewhere, where we hear Jesus speak, he's often speaking in parables. Uh, he's speaking in sermons. He's speaking in prayers that he uttered. He's speaking in many, many conversations that we are able to see as we read the scripture. Uh, and in that, in those settings, he, he shared in a very relaxed kind of a way, generally speaking. Uh, and uh, he was talking with people that he loved. He was encouraging the weak. He was lifting up the poor. He was proclaiming the good news to the poor and to everybody, uh, challenging those who thought too much of themselves or their religiosity, um, uh, people who thought too highly of their religious rightness. Um, and that was what people had known. But here, his words spoken on the cross are very brief, actually, and they're really uttered between agonized breaths as the life was draining out of his body. And so they were all pretty brief words, but they were potent words, and they really are words that expose the heart of Jesus, why he came, his humility, his compassion, his humanity, and ultimately his full acceptance of his mission and also his profound faith and love for the one who sent him, the Father. So let's consider today Jesus' first utterance that, we, that was read. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple to whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. So here, Jesus reminds us of the fact of his humanity in another sense. Jesus was a mother's son, right? He, he grew up in a human family. Uh, with uh, family allegiances, he had a stepfather, he had a mother, and as other scriptures say that he had uh, brothers and sisters and cousins. And maybe as we look at Jesus on the cross through the eyes of a mother, the, the mother who raised him, you know, who was present at his first words, his first steps, first time he scraped his knee, uh, his bar mitzvah, uh, perhaps when we consider Jesus in his suffering through the eyes of a mother who suffers also at the unjust murder of her son, we can feel the weight of Jesus' suffering in another sense, in his mother's agony. I just want you to note there that um, when Jesus refers to Mary as woman, that does not um, suggest any kind of disrespect in the Koine Greek. It was just a common way to refer to, to, um, to females. And it's actually true that Mary is called in Greek the Theotokos, the mother of God. Um, the, uh, Greek, our Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox uh, brothers and sisters uh, give great emphasis to that, they, uh, that Jesus... Uh, that Mary uh, is the Theotokos, the, the, the one who gave birth to God the Son, which is a mind-boggling thing when you think about it for a young teenage virgin to go through. But he was her boy nonetheless. And here in this moment when he speaks from the cross, he actually gives us a bit of a preview into the nature of the church as family. He tells his dear mother that since he will soon be gone, she is to take his disciple, John, as her son. So this is Jesus transferring responsibility for his mom to his best friend, beloved John. And he's also transferring responsibility uh, for John to Mary. John really was Jesus' security plan for Mary. 
Mary was, in a sense, to be John's adoptive parent. And so, yeah, this speaks of a kind of adoption. It speaks of family, but family not through bloodlines, but through relationship, through relationship to Jesus. Mary, again, was Jesus' mother. She was almost certainly uh, a widow and probably in her late 40s uh, with probably very little or no personal income. And since men controlled most legal things, having a male advocate was vital. And since Jesus, as the eldest son, was, was, was responsible for his mom's care, entrusting this responsibility to another before he died was very important. We all know that Jesus had younger brothers who would probably normally have taken on the responsibility, but here Jesus entrusts her care to a disciple, really treating John as a member of the family. That's how close Jesus and John were. And such statements, such testaments, could entrust care for a family member to a designated person. And one who was dying could assign property or could assign duties verbally. That was normal back then. Again, John was Jesus' friend, his best friend by all accounts. So even while he was dying, Jesus fulfilled his obligation to care for his widowed mother, entrusting her to the care of John, his disciple. Jesus entrusted the well-being of his mother to John rather than to one of his biological, one of her biological sons, most likely because they had not yet believed in him at that point in time. So Jesus becomes the center of and the reason for and the glue that holds together the family of God. And you and I, as followers of Jesus, our sister and brother in the Lord, united through faith in Jesus Christ, adopted into the family of God because of the sacrifice of the Son of God. And so here, Jesus inaugurated the web of relationships based on faith in him that would become known as the body of Christ, the church. And we, you and I, and all who trust in Jesus are the church. This is the most difficult of Jesus' final words to me, anyway. It's difficult on the one hand because it's absolutely loaded. It's a loaded, loaded statement with theological truth and power. We spoke about this um, at a Bible studies this week, and, and uh, it's very clear how impactful these words and, and what kind of questions these words raise for many people. Theology is a study of God, and the most brilliant thing about God, in my view, is that God chose in Jesus to suffer. He chose in Jesus to leave all of heaven's beauty and safety and splendor in order to come to this planet motivated only by the most pure love. He chose to allow himself to be, by those he came to love and save, beaten and broken and crucified, slaughtered like a lamb. And that's just the beginning. He also chose to have all of our sins placed upon him. So why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a powerful quote from Psalm 22, where Jesus identifies deeply with the suffering expressed in that passage. And I believe that these words recall the reality and the moment when Jesus separated from God the Father as he endured the wrath of God for the sins of humanity, cried out, expressing the sting of alienation and separation from God as he who knew no sin became sin for us. And you might wonder, how was Christ made to be sin for us? 
Well, someone described it this way. Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, voluntarily assumed, took upon himself the consequences of our sin, corruption and death, without sinning himself. He did this to make reconciliation possible. And to make reconciliation possible, God condemned a just person, Jesus, in the place of sinners. And he submitted to unjust suffering because of our sins. So salvation is the forgiveness of sins, but salvation is also far more than the forgiveness of sins. It is new life. It is our reconciliation with God, and it is our becoming new creatures and also participants in the very righteousness of God so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So this means that salvation is not just um, kind of um, juridical, like, like uh, the static legal pronouncement of a judge, but it's personal and relational and dynamic, like the, the sacrificial love of a father for his child. And so this passage that right, that's right here in front of us has been viewed by a lot of people as, as a good summary of the gospel. Jesus, the only entirely righteous one, took our sin upon himself on the cross and endured the punishment we deserved, namely death and separation from God. And thus, by this beautiful, marvelous exchange, he made it possible for us to receive his righteousness and thereby be reconciled to God. He was forsaken, stepping into our place as he took our sins upon him, forsaken by the Father, who in his holiness will not countenance or accommodate sin. I thought it might be good as we close to stand, if we can, if you want to, together to read from the prophet Isaiah, uh, from Isaiah 53. And let's have um, the ones on, on this side of me, to my right, read, read what's on the left, and you guys read what's on the right. So we can start here. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By Oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Let's, let's read this together. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. 
Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You may be seated. Thank you so much. So we have all, all of us who identify as followers of Christ, received this great forgiveness of sins, this great reconciliation with God brought about only through the suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus, prophesied by Isaiah, what we just read there, 700 plus years before Jesus was born. Because Jesus endured what he did on the cross and because Jesus triumphed over death, rising from the dead and ascended to the Father, we live as people who are free. We live as resurrection people. Can you say, I am a resurrection person? I am a resurrection person. We live free to love and to serve God and to serve people for the glory of God. So may we, as beloved, adopted children of the Most High King of the universe, more deeply embrace the amazing love and the amazing grace we have received from God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And may we also embrace our spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood, that we are part of the family of God, and our relationships truly matter to God and are actually key to God as he builds his kingdom, as he prepares his kingdom to come. And may we live in this love and grace believing it for ourselves, but not just believing it for ourselves, expressing it to others, eager to offer love and grace in all of our relationships. And also, also ready with an account, ready to give an account for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, Pastor Jonathan is going to be... Yeah.